Hi, everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. Welcome to our March or February webinar about the myths of investing. We're so glad you could join us today. For those of you who are new to Elevate, we are a wealth advising firm and we've been in Athens, Georgia for 40 years. We were founded in 1982 by Chuck Vickery. And now the company is run by our president and CEO, Deanne Rosso. Today, we are so happy to have with us um, one of the advisors who's been with the firm the longest. Clark Holt is coming up on his 20th anniversary with Elevate Wealth Advisory. Um, Clark has been here since 03. He focuses on wealth management with an emphasis on providing objective, conflict-free advice. Clark concentrates on developing long-term relationships through a commitment to quality client service. Clark received his Bachelor of Business Administration from Georgia Southwestern State University. He began his career as a financial advisor in 1999 with Smith Barney in Atlanta. And then, as I said, in 2003, he joined our team here at Elevate. Welcome, Clark. Hey, thanks, Betsy. Glad to see you. Good to see you. We'll let you get started. What would you like to tell us today about investing? So, uh, Betsy, thanks for that intro. And, and I would just say that one of the reasons I wanted to be a financial advisor was to help people make smart decisions. And I think it's important to remember that because I've been doing this quite a while. And it's good to think back about why did I really get in this industry? Um, and it, it really was to help people. and that started when I was in college, just trying to help people make smart decisions and how to allocate their their money. And of course, at a, such a young age, a lot of people uh, may or may not have taken my advice. But that's how I really got started and had this had a passion to be a financial advisor or a wealth advisor. And I'm again coming up on twenty years here, and just very uh, very pleased. And still, not a day goes by that I don't get up and enjoy what I do and enjoy helping people. So. Uh, we will get started right now real quick. So just give me one second. All right. And while Clark's getting ready to share his screen, I'll let you know that we have a question and answer box you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions for Clark throughout the presentation, go ahead and pop them into that box or else in the chat box, you can also get messages to us that way as well. And we'll go ahead and take all of those questions at the end. So everybody should be able to see this first screen, 10 investing myths and realities. And these are, we're counting down from number 10 to number one and really not in any particular order, but what I felt like were, were I, I guess, the, the way I would rank these. And so as we go along, if you do have questions, you're, uh, you know, certainly feel free to, to, to hold those questions just till the end and we can try to address them. And if not, Certainly, I can get with people afterwards via email or a phone call and go through things. So let's get started. So number 10, you should wait until the dust settles to invest your money. And I've heard this from clients over the years, depending on what was happening in the economy with the markets, um, different events. And so that's a common myth is, hey, I should wait until the all clear or wait until the dust settles to invest your money. And that's a challenging thing to do in the sense that if we have a long-term time horizon and we are so, you know, so super focused on saving while we work and while we're in those accumulation years, but once we get into retirement, we've got about three decades based on our life expectancy. And so three decades to try to live off our investments. So waiting for the all clear to invest uh, could be very detrimental to the wealth that we create over time. And if we look at different events over the years, going back to 1987, and we look at a, a really a balanced strategy, which is 60% stocks and 40% bonds, which is a time-tested standard balanced approach. And we go through time through 89, 98, 2000, 2001, and then 
this does not include the coronavirus. But I mean, it does paint a picture. And so if you look at a balanced strategy and then one year, three years, and five years after the actual event, you can see the robust returns that ultimately come. And if you wait for the all clear, or if you wait for the dust to settle, you've missed the recovery and then some. And a lot of those returns come very fast, very quickly. And in, in every case, we've seen five years later, significant performance after the event. And, and again, this, this walks us through the dot-com crash, the 9-11 attacks, the bankruptcies in 2008. So again, even three years and five years, it makes such a difference to not only invest when you can, when you have the money, but to stay invested along the way. And another way of looking at this is if we just take the index that we most, that a lot of people follow and, and hear about, the S&P 500 index, which is the U.S. market. And we look at the January return going back to 1926. And so the January return is indicated by the red dot. And then the blue bar is the February through December return. If we try to make some sort of determination based on, okay, what happens in January? Maybe I'm not going to invest now, or maybe I'll hold off and wait a little bit. And so, because a lot of times January is a negative month. And again, the, the point is, we can't draw any conclusions from this. We have to invest when we have, when we're able, we have to invest consistently. We cannot pause investing. We cannot get out of the markets and then try to get back in. And so January might be a negative month, but that's no reason to stop or pause or pivot. We just have to continue, continue to invest, focus on that long-term horizon, thinking about those three decades in retirement. And there's so many things we hear about in the media. Business Week, cover of Business Week in 1979, the death of equities, uh, 1998, the crash of, uh, of 98, can the economy hold up? And then it's how to reach a million dollars, how simple is it to retire rich, you know, in different print media. Um, and then we have different periods of time where for example, March of 2000, the NASDAQ reached an all-time high. And, but again, we have market crashes. We have bear market of, of you know, of a, of a real strong degree in 2002, 2005, home prices are going up. And then, you know, you get to 08 and we have the bankruptcies, the global financial crisis. There's there always are events that could cause us to want to stop or pause. And the, the key is to be consistent, be patient, continue to invest, and just stay focused on that multi-decade time frame. Number nine, and this is one of my favorites, you must time the market to be successful. And so that's unfortunately, that's something that. I think a lot of people feel sometimes or, or get caught up in uh, with investing. And no one can predict market declines or how quickly they'll recover. And so rather than forecast and guess when this will happen or how severe it might be, we've just got to stick to our plan and, and don't fold and, and give into that urge to pivot or go into a more conservative allocation, um, even though a decline will come. And declines are normal, but they're temporary. And the key is to stay invested so that we can capture that rebound when it occurs, like that slide we saw earlier. Um, and nine out of 15 bear markets since 1929, if you stay the course, you the decline in value is made up in less than one year. And so very important not to try to time the market. And this is another way of looking at that. The cost of mistiming the market, and this is, a, again, looking at the S&P 500 going back to 1990, is, is, is significant. And this is an example of $1,000. And if we just miss the 25 best days from 1990 through 2021, uh, our return is less if we miss 
15 of the single best days, you know, certainly it's, um, it, again, you can see the pattern. And if you just stay invested that whole period, just, just stay allocated, stay disciplined, the $1,000 grows to almost $27,000. Uh, but again, by missing one, five, 15, 25 of those best days, it can really impact our returns and our outcomes. And, and that's, that's avoidable. We can, we can, we can control that. This was actually a screenshot that I took off of CNBC's website last week or the week before, and sort of ties in with kind of the first myth, you know, waiting for the all clear, waiting for, you know, waiting for the dust to settle or maybe timing the market. And it's three experts, uh, Jeremy Siegel, Ray Dalio, and then one of the heads of BlackRock, and they all have different opinions. Uh, one says he sees stocks rallying 10 to 15% this year. Ray Dalio says he thinks cash is the way to go um, more than stocks and bonds. So he would be all cash. And then the BlackRock head or one of their uh, leaders says he favors bonds and international stocks over U.S. equity. So they all have different opinions and they might be right. They may all be wrong. But everybody, every expert has this opinion as to what the market's going to do. And they don't know. Uh, it's You can make a prediction. Uh, I heard an interview this morning on CNBC with the president or CEO of Interactive Brokers, which is a, an online uh, day trading or not day trading, but investing um, platform, sort of like Robinhood, but it's mostly for do-it-yourselfers. And he said that he's been bearish on the market for some time. And he admitted that he'd been wrong. And so even CEOs or, or so-called experts don't know what's going to happen. So again, we can't time the market. They can't time the market. So it's better to stay invested, continue to invest all the way through your accumulation years. Another slide that I, that I like a lot is, again, looking at the S&P 500. And when you see a lot of slides that I share, it's Typically, I'll show the S&P 500 because it's so common and we have so much data uh, that we can pull there. And so this is just a look at the returns for the S&P 500 since, uh, since 1980. And the blue dot indicates the drawdown for the index during that year. And I think what this shows is any given year, we can almost bank on the fact that there'll be probably a 14% decline. Now, whether that's February or August or November, we don't know. But ultimately, the total return for that year is positive. And in this slide, 35 out of 42 years, we have a positive return. And that gives us, I think, confidence. I think it gives us perspective. And again, not trying to time the market or make a change or an adjustment based on short-term performance is so important. Uh, and again, if you look at the, the average return on this slide, based on this slide is, is right over 12% per year. Okay, so myth number eight, as we move along, the US market offers more than enough diversification. And I'll admit I've heard this one before, I heard it in 2000 when the U.S. market had several years in the late 90s where it was the U.S. market was just knocking the cover off the ball and the returns were significant. And so people felt like I, I'll just I'll just own the U.S. market and that's all I need and maybe sprinkle in a few bonds and, and that's it. And so the I think that's a misconception. And if we look at the S&P 500, and as far as how that's diversified, now this was a snapshot from last year, maybe the middle of last year, and these companies that you see here and the percentage weight that they have in the S&P 500 is significant. And so just to, to share, the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index, so it gives a lot of weight to the larger companies or the bigger market cap companies. 
So these these have these few names have a huge influence on the index, and so it's not as diversified as we think. And not just that, it's 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 the fact that there's thousands and thousands of wonderful companies outside the U.S. And if we pass on those non-U.S. markets, we're avoiding a lot of great investments around the world. And whether that's Toyota, whether that's Nestle, whether that's Unilever, um, Sony, there are names and companies, great businesses that are not in the United States. And the returns for certain markets around the world can be um, quite good. And so we don't want to leave 40% of the global market just sitting on the table. And I think it's, it's important to know there are times when the U.S. market will outperform international, and that's been the case lately, but there are also times when international outperforms U.S. It's a cycle, it's random, just the same way that large companies might outperform small, and that could that could cycle back around as well, where small typically outperforms large. And so we want to make sure that we look at the entire global market and have, you know, not leaving those, those international stocks um, on the table. It could be an opportunity cost that, you know, that's um, this significant as well. And so right now, again, here's just a kind of a, a look at international versus U.S. U.S. markets, it's, a, it's around 60 percent. And again, we're not talking about the bond market. We're just talking about the stock markets or equity markets and the international representing about 40 percent. And so we want to have that diversification. So here's a look and I've highlighted the best performer column of developed markets since 2002 through 2021. And if we look at the best performing markets, the U.S. was number one once in 2014. And so uh, this, again, shows us that returns can be very good around the world. And we want to have exposure to all of these, all of these different markets so that we can have that balanced approach no matter what. Uh, countries performing better or, or worse, it's having that balanced um, mix so that we can capture returns. Even when U.S. underperforms, we can still see positive outcomes over time. And so the average of the worst performers during this period was negative, almost negative 13. The average of the best was around 35. And, and so it's important, again, to not leave that 40% on the table when we're building portfolios or when we're investing. So again, significant portion outside the U.S., thousands of companies from different countries. And, and I think the key is the potential to outperform over any given period. And we nobody knows when, nobody knows to what degree performance will be better or worse. So you just have to have that balanced approach. Myth number seven advisor diversification. And I'll explain what this is. There's a, there's, a, and I think it's a, a misconception among investors that as situations become more complex in their lives financially, or as their wealth becomes more significant, there's the thought that I need three or four financial advisors because I've got X amount of wealth, and this is a way for me to diversify. And the truth is, there are actually some, some really big risks with that. And we can look at those. Um, and I, and I've, I've actually seen this firsthand. The, the real three big risk factors with having multiple advisors is asset allocations are more than likely inappropriate when you look at when you compare. And that's one of the things we want to try to avoid. We want to have proper, appropriate asset allocation in for, for all of their wealth, for all of a client's wealth. And so the second is there's just no coordination with regards to rebalancing. And I would also add to that there's no coordination with regards to things like tax loss harvesting. And that's a that's a big deal. And 
there can be a lot of risk in one portfolio with one advisor and not a lot of risk with the other. And just having no alignment a lot of times is sort of neutralizes whatever the whatever the goal is. If you're trying to, to get sustained growth of your portfolio or your wealth, a lot of times one can be pulling against, against the other, whether one's too risky or not risky enough. And then the third one is absolutely true. And it's just that no one advisor has a good handle on how everything interrelates. And not having that, again, is just, it, it sort of mitigates any sort of success that, that the client or the investor could have by having a comprehensive single approach, not to mention simplifying their, their accounts, the number of accounts they've got for their spouses or for their heirs in the event something happens to them and having that singular strategy and that, that one relationship. And so myth number six, outperformance is a financial goal. And that's just not true. Our performance is not a financial goal and it's not a financial plan. An example of a financial goal is having a sustainable rising income during retirement that's going to outpace inflation. That's a financial goal. And our performance is not consistently achievable and, and really performance chasing is speculating rather than investing. And so when you look at the things that we should be focused on, it's in, in, in the outcomes that we have, like the long-term positive investment outcomes, it's mostly due to the behavior and the temperament of the investor. And that's just true. It, it's, it's, there's so many studies and there's so much data that, sh that shows that. And, and we've got, you know, we, we, wanna, we wanna perform well and I think one example is if, if, if someone has reached the upper echelon of wealth where there's just not the need or the necessity to take too much risk or, or really um, stick our necks out too far, because if you've reached that level, and not a lot of people can get to this point, but a lot, a lot can where you don't have to take a lot of risk to have a comfortable lifestyle and achieve the goals that you want to achieve. And that's important. And so, um, so again, our performance is not a goal. It's certainly nice. And that's something we like to see. And we know clients would like to see. Um, but the, the, the performance will come. But it's really based on our temperament, our discipline, and our behavior. And this is just a quick look at domestic mutual funds and the performance. And... This is, you know, talking about our performance and, and looking at managers that, that mutual fund managers that manage money that, you know, maybe they're on the cover of Fortune magazine as the, you know, one of the top five mutual funds for 2022. And there's lots of studies and, and research that goes back that while that's great and that can certainly be the case, it's, you know, how consistent is that? How can they deliver that consistently? Or can they do that? And typically, 80% fail to repeat that superior performance. And usually these are kind of looking, we're looking at these in like five-year rolling periods. So you may have a great manager with a great five-year track record, but then the next five years, he's at the bottom of the list. And that's one of the reasons that we adhere to an evidence-based asset class approach, buying and owning the whole market, not cherry-picking individual stocks, things like that. And so it's, it's important to remember that uh, superior performance is, is great, but again, that consistency is very, um, it's very tough to continue to achieve. Myth number five, global diversification doesn't work anymore. And this has been a recent, um, I think, idea or thought and or concern. And and again, this goes back to U.S. outperforming most recently, and that's been the case for, for quite a while now, um, although we know and we can see the, the data that that does cycle around periodically. But again, we've just been in a period where U.S. has outperformed um, international. Now, more short term, really, in the last couple of months, 
international has outperformed the U.S. And, and so I think internationals do. And if we look around the world for value, international offers really uh, great value if you consider how, it, how it's valued versus the U.S. or U.S. equities. So this myth, we can, we can sort of look at this and say, you know, obviously the performance of U.S., um, just this outperformance we've had, it's really, it's no indication of what's going to happen going forward. And we've got to spread our investments among U.S. and non-U.S. markets. And that way we're not reliant just on any one country or one index or, um, and, and the returns again will be more consistent, more balanced. And thereby we reduce our risk um, in the portfolio. And we'll look at a slide here shortly that kind of talks about that a little bit as far as US versus international. And here it is. And so this is the decade of the 2000s. And I share this slide a lot and I, and I picked this time period because of what happened this decade, because we just have so many great examples of major events that happened that could have caused us to say, let's wait for the dust to settle, could have caused us to say, let's time the market. And so this is a quick look at January 2000 through December of 2009. And what you see on this slide at the bottom, across the bottom, we've got the S&P 500 index on the far left. And then we have various asset class or evidence-based investment vehicles um, from dimensional fund advisors or just indexes that we can track uh, and have data going back this time frame. And so, for example, we've got small value, U.S. small, U.S. large value, real estate, and then international. And so you can see for this decade, if you if you started in the S&P 500 and you had a million dollars, you ended the decade with less, a little, or right around 950,000 and maybe a little bit, just a, a shade less. And if you had a diversified approach that same time period using all of these asset classes that you see listed here, or these strategies that you see, your million dollars would be just over 2 million. And that's, again, a testament to a globally diversified approach with all the asset classes, all the countries uh, represented so that you get that, again, that more balanced, consistent return. And this is just a look from 1990 at Yelp. The yellow line is non-U.S. The green or sort of turquoise is, is U.S. And then the the dots would be global and the returns are all pretty much in line. And so there's not really anything that stands out that would lead me to say we should be just in the U.S. or we should be overweight U.S. and underweight this or, or again, trying to pivot and make those make those calls. It, but just following that dotted line is the best approach and you'll get the returns that are there for the taking over time. This is a look at the world map of equities. Again, we've saw, we saw this a little bit earlier, just a, a little bit different visual, about 60% US and the rest 40% international. Uh, again, lots of opportunities outside the US. So we wanna make sure we focus on having that diversification. This is a look at developed market returns, another way to look at it. And we call this sort of a, a Skittles chart. And we've got countries, we've got developed markets ranked from the highest return to the lowest return. And there's no predictable pattern where we can say, okay, we know, we know what's going to, you know, we've seen the performance from last year, we can position for this year and going forward. It's, it's completely random. And U.S. has been towards the top lately, uh, but there are many, there's, there's so many times where the U.S. has been towards the bottom. And again, this chart just shows the, uh, the, uh, the sort of the nature of how markets work is that it's unpredictable, it's random. So have all of these represented in the portfolio so you can get those returns wherever they come from. And this is just a quick slide on the bond market. Uh, you know, we look at fixed income, we've got to look outside the US. We want to have US, obviously, but 
as far as bonds and fixed income, there's a there's a lot of opportunity outside the U.S. Okay, myth number four: avoid equities during retirement years and maintain a conservative portfolio to avoid volatility and risk. And there are people that, and, and this is not um, abnormal, and it's not. I don't think it's it's wrong to have this sort of feeling, but I've I've experienced these concerns from um, a couple of people I've dealt with over the years. Is that it's the notion that when we after we've been in these accumulation years, and once we retire, we just shore up everything is conservative, and we'll live off what we have. And the truth is, we can't afford to take that risk because of the life expectancy that we have and because of inflation. And so right now, joint life expectancy for a 62-year-old non-smoking couple is 92. So we've got to think in 30-year clips. And we've got to plan on a retirement income that's going to rise over time and outpace the cost of all the goods and services that we need. So we can just bank on the fact that every year, all the things we need to buy or pay for, they're just they're going to cost more. And we've just gone through a, a big um, you know, example of that with inflation. And the interesting thing that I find is that, and this is where we try to really educate and give people perspective is that people that retire are more worried, not everybody, but there are people that, that, that worry more about principal protection or loss of their principal. And they're much less concerned about the loss of purchasing power, which to me is a greater risk. And the, the risk there is that we end up depleting our assets during that 30 year retirement period, or we end up maybe not having the income, the sustainable income to offset that rise in prices. And so we've got to have that rising income, um, it, it, you know, to, to offset the living cost as we go forward into retirement. So having equities and fixed income in retirement is prudent. It's, it's not that we might not make adjustments, maybe subtle along the way, but we've got to continue to maintain that growth to give us the income that we need. Myth number three. My portfolio needs to be actively managed and adjusted continuously based on market and or economic conditions. And that's just not true. The truth is sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. And trying to time markets as, you, as we've seen in these other slides looking at the data means we really, we have to be right. We have to be right twice. If, you know, we have to be right when we sell or when we pivot and, and maybe go into a more conservative posture. And then we have to be right again when we decide, hey, here's it, this, is the, this is the all clear, let's get back in. And those, th that's just impossible. And having the discipline, the patience, and, and just remaining calm and just let the market work, work for you, let it work for you and it will. Um, you know, actively investing money is a zero sum game. And there's lots of studies that show that. We saw a slide earlier about the outperformance and then not being able to continue to deliver that. So again, zero sum game if you're actively managing money. Most people should expect to lose money when they actively invest, to be honest. And so there's a quote from Gene Fama Jr. Um, that says, your money is like so, the more you handle it, the less you will have. And actually, I heard that quote from Chuck a long time ago. So he may have beat uh, Gene Fama Jr. to that. But I like that because it makes a lot of sense. And I think it, it applies here. Myth number two, I can try to pick individual stocks. And so I think everybody would admit that at some point in their life, they have they've had this sort of maybe this overconfidence that, hey, I can pick individual stocks or I'm just going to uh, see how I do or I've got the, the, the expertise and the temperament for this. And so that's a tough game. And I learned that way early on in college. And then once I started my career with Smith Barney is 
it's it's tough to pick individual stocks and it's tough to stick with them. And and the fact that you could be wrong regardless of what of, of the type of company or the name of the company. And you know, individual stocks just may or may not follow what the rest of the market's doing. And we'll look at an example of that in just a minute. Concentrated stock positions can lead to bad outcomes over long periods. And the tough part is if we are emotionally attached to a position and we've gone through, say, a decade of bad outcomes or bad returns, we're sort of stuck because we feel like we've just got to wait because we know it's going to come back. And, you know, company specific risk is real and it just makes no sense to fall in love with a stock or a company. And again, the quality, the reputation of the company is completely irrelevant. And we'll look at some examples of that here. So this is an example of the S&P 500. And every one of these slides is the S&P 500 compared to a company. And this one is Formel Foods. And it goes back to 2000. And so you can see the, the, the cumulative return for both. And so if you were lucky enough to, to invest in Hormel and you were also patient enough to leave it alone and stick with it, you had a significant return compared to the index. And here's an example looking at IBM. Great company, uh, used to be one of the top weights in the S&P 500 way back in the day, just like we saw that slide earlier with, with Apple and Microsoft and Amazon today. So again, we look at IBM, the returns were positive, but nowhere near that of Hormel and, and really not close enough to the S&P to warrant uh, saying that was you know, a successful outcome. And so in this case, every, in, really in every case, owning a basket of these is the better approach. But picking individual stocks based on whether they're a Fortune 500 company or whether they're the most profitable company or whether they've got the best reputation, that's not a, 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 an indication of how the stock will perform. And so here's a look, there's, again, that's a look at IBM. And then this is really a good example. Here's probably one of the most well-known companies in the, in the world and, and really probably one of the best reputations for such a long period, General Electric, GE, compared to the S&P. And so, you know, this goes back to 2000 again. And if you own, if you bought General Electric and you held it for this entire period, um, you can see the performance of the stock. And so compared to the S&P 500. So again, regardless of the reputation or the quality of the company, that does not indicate the, the returns that you will experience. And this is Intel almost as um, underwhelming as GE. And Intel is a semiconductor company that's been around forever. Um, and again, you can see the S&P returns versus the individual stock. And um, it's just a very difficult game. And, and if you're trying to pick individual stocks, it is speculating. And if you do that, I don't, I'm not against it. I just think that if you do that, your core, Wealth should be managed in an appropriate fashion, um, globally diversified, you know, all those things. And if you want to have a, a just an account with a very small amount of money just to do this with it, where there's there's no risk to your total wealth or to your really to your uh, retirement income or your outcomes, that's OK. But very small scale, um, just to just if you're interested in doing that. So. And here's a look at the S&P versus all four. And again, diversification reduces risk, right? And so rather than concentrate on one stock or two stocks or three, let's own the entire market. And we don't wanna have one company's performance jeopardize our wealth. And this could be not just for people that are buying individual stocks, it could be for people that work for companies that have huge positions because of stock options or um, accumulating the stock in their 401k over time. So you've got to keep that in check. 
keep it balanced and diversified and not take that unnecessary risk. Number one myth, men make better investors than women. And this is not true based on research, based on analysis. So women actually control about just over 11 trillion in investable assets. And they have really the number of women with six figure incomes is rising at more than three times the rate of their male counterparts. They're also investing as much. And so right now the surveys are showing that that men's 60% of men say they own stocks versus 57 for women. And I see that probably going certainly um, over, you know, in, in favor of women uh, over time or probably in a short period of time. And then Fidelity did a study on more than 5 million customers um, uh, in, in looking at how women are better investors than men are trying to, to, to show that, um, that pattern. And it looked at the last 10 years and they found that on average, women outperform men by almost half a percent per year. And this, I think it's, there's a lot of reasons for this. Women, uh, this may be because women investors on average tend to trade less. They tend to be less active. And we talked about how active sometimes, just like if we're with that bar of soap, the more you handle it, the less you have. And so they tend to trade less. They tend to stay the course and they tend to have more diversified portfolios. So they're not concentrated. And that's important. And I mean, we know that women tend to live longer than men. And so this is really critical and important that they have an understanding and can have these successful outcomes with their investments. And so that as they live those, those, you know, living in that 30 year or 40 year retirement, they've got a sustainable income. And so this is, um, and I can say that, that I think I would add to this. I think the, the temperament and the discipline of female investors versus male investors, I think is better um, on average. And, and sometimes they can balance each other out and that's a good thing. But this was a, this was a great, um, I think myth, I think this was, why I saved this one for last. And it, I think it is a misconception and it is a myth, but it's just not true. And so um, I congratulate women, invest, women investors and um, they do a great job. And, and so um, that concludes our top 10 myths and realities about investing. And so I will turn it back over to Betsy to see if we have any questions uh, that I can answer. And if certainly if you have something you wanna talk about more in depth, we can get together after the uh, after the webinar. Thanks so much, Clark. That was so interesting. Of course, my favorite one was number one. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, we do have a couple questions from our viewers. Um, mm -hmm. When you were talking a little bit about allocations in the beginning, one question is what allocation should a 75 year old typically consider? OK, so we could. Allocation, um, I can address both. It could either be stock versus bond allocation, but also maybe U.S. versus non-U.S. allocation. Um, and that's the, the short answer is that really depends on that person's situation. Um, I could certainly generically come up with an allocation for a 75-year-old, but there's so many other variables that would come into play to, for that to be appropriate. Um, and, you know, I think, I think I would say this, I think you have to have, um, an overweight towards equities. I think you have to have an overweight towards us equities, but I also think you have to have a meaningful weight to, to non us and to fixed income. And certainly fixed income needs to be there for people in retirement and around that age or that demographic. So. But the, again, the fixed income allocation might be different depending on what their other sources of income are, what their, you know, their level of assets might be. And so hope that that helps a little bit. But again, it, it's really more a case by case. 
Very good, thank you. Um, one comment is experts are predicting that equity returns for years to come are going to be lower than in the past. So what would you say about that? So we've heard um, in, in, our, in this presentation, you saw some of those quotes from those so-called experts or leaders. And I think people are, everybody wants to predict or make a, make a sort of, uh, some sort of prediction about what market returns will be. And I think there's a camp that believes that returns will be lower than over time. And there's also a different camp that believes that returns might be as good as they've been historically. And I think it's almost more convenient for people to, to sort of say, hey, let's, we're not going to have the same returns we used to have. This, things have changed. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that we just have to sort of tune out the noise and you really just look historically, like long-term averages since the 20s, you know, for the markets are hovering around 9% average returns. And I don't know that has anything changed over time. I and mean, I think we've got, you know, comp there's so many great companies around the world. Um, I think we can plan to be conservative based on like what we're planning as far as our retirement income. I think that's a good thing. So like, if you think you might get 8%, let's plan on 7 or six and a half and let's let's plan for the worst and kind of make you know if anything happens extra that's sort of icing on the cake right very good well if anyone has additional questions please feel free to email marketing at elevate-wealth.com and we'll make sure that clark gets your question and then i'm going to share my screen real quick um i want to show you all what we've been up to here so Here's our Facebook page. And if you would like to get information on future webinars we have, this is one great place to go. You can go down to our events tab and you can see all of our upcoming webinars. Next month, we're going to be focusing on tax planning and then also our YouTube channel. So one thing that we've been working on and Clark will be part of this in the next couple of months is you might have seen this book that we love to refer to and give out the 27 principles of investing. And um, we're doing a video series about these different rules. And Clark actually made mention to a few of them today in the presentations. I thought that was cool. So be sure if you don't already um, subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can go to youtube.com and then look for Elevate Wealth Advisory. Look for the one in Athens, Georgia, and you'll see Deanne's face there. Um, and then also our website, elevate-wealth.com. You can go here. And on the menu bar, you can go to attend webinars and see our list of webinars. You can read our blog. Um, it's just a great source of information. Um, just if you ever have any questions, you can just fill out the form and send a quick question to us. So um, thank you all so much for joining us today. We always love seeing you.